Thank you very much. Well, I'm going to be on a little more serious note today, even more serious than biochemistry. <laughs> but my father, my father Leonard Tornheim was a mathematician. He proved the gelfond tornheim theorem. Gelfond proposed it. I went to a work-study college with a year-round program and only got home twice in five years. But my dad usually stopped off on a business trip for a visit about once a year. This first poem was written in anticipation, waiting for dad. I'm waiting for the face that's half a mirror of mine, though now the bordering trace of silver and here and there a deeper line distinguish it, the stout and weathered bow from each maturing sprout. I'm waiting for the tread, footsteps that carry me in lullaby to bed, or a slower pace to keep my company, and with a gentle hand, once led me on the path I would have planned. I'm waiting for the voice that wiped away my tears, and smiled till I rejoiced, and bore the trials of my twenty growing years. From him I came, and yet, the more toward him I've grown each time we've met. In 2004, when my stepmother died, he moved to Boston. He was in good shape initially. After all, he had run marathons in his 60s and 70s. As he said, the first nine decades were great. But in his last couple years, he declined mentally and then physically. Fresh snowfall. A fresh snowfall covers the far field, a white expanse, featureless, devoid of landmark. But if you ventured in, you could always turn around and follow your footsteps out. There is fresh snow on my father's mind, obscuring the tracks of his long life. New steps, especially, are quickly covered, as though a blizzard followed him. I see him pause in some confusion, searching for a word, a thought, a lost step in the snow. Beet soup. The face I've loved since I was small is now beet reddened without embarrassment. For wayward drips of soup escape the lower lip and meander down unsensed. And I, seated several chairs away, am uncertain how to signal quietly that the dab of a napkin is in order. So in the end, I do not interrupt his enjoyment of the family meal. For he is with us who knew him in his strength, and now in later years, gratefully and lovingly will make allowance for his diminished state. Heat stains are superficial, after all, beneath his smile in our company, and can be rinsed off afterwards in somewhat greater privacy. This next poem was written shortly before his death. Kaddish is the Jewish prayer recited for the dead. It praises God and does not mention death. Can you say Kaddish for the living? Can you say Kaddish for the living, the living who lost their lives through broken synapses or neurons clogged or tangled, whatever it takes to let the memories leak out? Can you mourn with them, holding their warm hands, seeing their eyes that know sometimes or maybe have forgotten you and all they did before? Can you grieve while they still walk, run out of tears before they leave, so the Kaddish is an echo from its time with either heart? When should you speak the words out loud, praising God in your anguish? Can you say Kaddish for the living? This last poem was written last spring. Clouds in Springtime. He died the end of August, so winter was a time for mourning, what with the darkness, the sleep and snow, the cold without, or the cold within. And now, and now, in early springtime, the trees again grow green, some pink with blossoms. As sap flows anew, so should happier thoughts. The bears emerge from winter caves in search of blueberry delights, and I, too, climb out. But even in warm sunlight, at times a shadow passes over. Announcements on the trolley call out Brookline Hills or Brookline Village where I'm reminded that I used to stop to see him at assisted living and then the nursing home. His body shrank, his mind retreated, yet his smile remained until the mouth relaxed open 
in the unending sleep, silent, unmoving on the hospital bed. But he kept teaching after he died. Some of you first-year students may have met him in the laboratory lab, in the anatomy lab. He was a donor. 